Hello, and welcome to this virtual learning session, Artificial Intelligence Applications in HR Technology. Artificial Intelligence, or AI as it's commonly referred to, has grown and developed rapidly over the last two decades, and today permeates many, area of, many areas of life, from our shopping experiences, to our digital devices, to our power management systems, uh, to medical research. There's also been great leaps in capabilities and the number of offerings related to artificial intelligence in the realm of hiring and HR technology. And while there are many innovative and exciting vendors and solutions, a lot of practitioners find themselves overwhelmed and have difficulty understanding the actual role that AI plays in hiring systems, what differentiates offerings, and how these tools can best be leveraged, or if they even should. So with that in mind, this instructional video is designed to be a AI and HR tech boot camp, if you will. And we're going to do our best to answer all the questions you might have about um, everything related to artificial intelligence and its applications inside of a hiring context. About me, uh, would love to introduce myself. I've spent the last decade or so intimately involved with researching HR technology and advising organizations on technology impact as well as digital transformation strategy. So delighted to be here today. Um, this topic is something that I'm particularly passionate about. At Talent Tech Labs, the organization I'm part of, our mission is to elevate the state of the art in recruitment technology. Uh, we're a research advisory firm exclusively focused on analyzing uh, uh, talent acquisition and talent management technologies. And we generate our research by looking at thousands of companies, understanding the product, the features and functionalities, grilling the executive teams and the product roadmap. Um, and we also talk to uh, many practitioners and the end users of said technology um, to see what's actually happening in the market and to validate some of the claims um, that companies makes. And it's from kind of the convergence of these two uh, lenses, both on the technology side and on our practitioner side, that inform our, our research um, and insights. And you're going to see this kind of uh, promulgate throughout the, uh, the, the presentation here today. So with that, here is our agenda. We're going to introduce artificial intelligence as a, uh, as a concept. So the goal is to help you understand what we're talking about when we, when we mention um, AI and AI systems. We'll look at the breadth of recruiting and employment use cases that leverage AI. We'll give you some tools and a framework for assessing AI capabilities in the vendors that you may already be leveraging internally and also in some of the tools that you might be considering and provide some best practices around uh, using AI-based systems. We'll wrap up with a discussion around AI ethics, AI risks, and how to address them, and give you the latest on AI regulations and what you need to be aware of moving forward. All right, so we'll start with uh, what I call the vision versus reality. And I call it that because despite how powerful artificial intelligence is, I think most people's understanding of AI uh, is, is more um, in line with um, the vision of what it could be or perhaps how it's been described um, you know, in, in, uh, secularly versus what it actually is in its commercial application. So let's start by defining AI, looking at some everyday examples and then some key terms and concepts here you're gonna to wanna to be familiar with. The academic definition is over here on the left and what I consider more helpful practical definitions over on the right. So the, the academic definition of AI is the study of an intelligent agents. Any system that perceives its environment takes actions that maximize its chance of achieving its goals. And uh, really what these systems do, they're, they're, you know, I think the layman's way to understand this is they're machines that mimic human decision making or problem solving. Um, and these are decisions that require cognition, uh, perception, judgment, um, or, or context. These systems self-learn and um, uh, they recognize patterns and they'll modify their outputs based on additional inputs. Um, and so inside this broad definition are many different bespoke applications and use cases for um, artificial intelligence. And so let's just run through a few of these um, uh, in everyday life. If you've ever done a uh, Google search, then you've used, you've used an AI product. If you've ever gone shopping online and had a product recommended to you, then you've, uh, you've, you've interacted with AI. If you've ever had a, a friend suggested to you, say on a social network, um, you've interacted with AI. Um, so these are all kind of everyday use cases that are pretty embedded in, into our lives. Um, some you know, possibly more advanced use cases, but um, uh, still kind of from a consumer's perspective. Um, if you've ever done any kind of self-driving assistance in your car, um, those technologies heavily rely on AI to understand road conditions and make decisions around, uh, around driving. 
If you've ever used a smartphone uh, voice assistant, you've leveraged multiple AI technologies to understand what you're saying and the context of that and to answer whatever particular questions that you might have asked. Um, um, and if you've ever done any kind of translation service, those engines are also powered um, by AI. So the reason I bring up these examples specifically from kind of outside of uh, HR applications um, is for two reasons. First is we're going to see um, artificial intelligence is applied typically to very narrow um, and specific problem sets. And when we start talking about AI use in HR systems, it's important to understand that the, the specific scope of artificial intelligence in a, in a particular system and what it is that that tool is actually designed uh, to do. And second, I want to highlight some examples, you know, outside of hiring to illustrate that when, you know, this is done thoughtfully, AI solutions can really have a big impact on improving the way things that, that get done. And they're generally pretty benign, despite, you know, the fact that uh, some of, the, some of the, the news headlines, you know, tend to capture, you know, the, uh, the scary elements um, of AI. So with that, um, let us move forward and I want to um, highlight some key concepts related to, to artificial intelligence. And the goal here isn't that you need to be an expert in all these areas, but you should at least be conversant in these terms, as this is kind of the language that vendors, you know, may talk to you in. And so, you know, uh, knowing what these terms mean will help you to, to ask better questions um, and understand uh, how these areas impact your own business. The first one is uh, machine learning. And machine learning is um, a, a field of artificial intelligence research that is heavily reliant on statistics um, for its models. And for all intents and purposes, today, machine learning and AI are almost interchangeable terms um, from a practical standpoint. Um, these systems uh, learn, they're trained on a data set where kind of inputs are defined ahead of time and uh, outputs or successful outputs are, are given to the model. Um, and then it uses that data to make predictions about what it, what it thinks it should decide to do in the future based on, on its historical precedent and the data it's been trained on. And the system can kind of uh, teach itself to recognize pattern and change its decisioning um, based on if a programmer um, modifies those inputs or outputs or the weighting thereof or if the system itself gets new data and learns from that data and gets kind of new uh, validation. A couple of other concepts is uh, one's called supervised or directed learning. Uh, this describes a situation where the, uh, the vendor um, ahead of deploying an AI solution is going to train a model on subset of data. It might be your company's data, it could be your um, internal data that lives in your HRIS or your applicant tracking system. Um, it could be external data such as, you know, uh, uh, LinkedIn profiles or external um, uh, profiles. And uh, the data, though, is going to be supervised in order to get it to a point where it's ready to deploy. Unsupervised learning describes uh, a method where unstructured and untagged data is examined without kind of any guidance by the vendor. And the goal here is um, to understand relationships, typically in massive data sets. So for example, unsupervised learning could be used in, a, in um, kind of understanding the relationship of skills and companies and say pay in ways that might not be obvious to somebody who is trying to uh, kind of programmatically uh, set up those inputs. This can be really good for um, kind of unstructured learning and relationship learning. Algorithm just describes a set of computer instructions that dictate how a process is performed. Um, and typically when used in the context of AI, it's describing you know, the, uh, the, the algorithm is the mechanism by which the system makes a decision or comes to a decision. So natural language processing is a field of AI research related to machine understanding um, of linguistics and human uh, text and speech. Being able to understand some of the nuances that happen um, in, in words and conversation, um, you know, in one context versus another. Lots of applications here in, in, in HR um, in recruiting. Neural networks and deep learning. So this is a, a, another term that you might um, hear as you're talking to vendors. And this is an AI model that mimics the human brain um, in that it kind of layers, um, uh, layers the way that it analyzes data. And it's used for um, areas that require kind of massive amounts of, of data. Um, things like facial recognition and image tagging, you know, uh, fraud detection and finance um, and, and, and forecasting. And 
any solution that just has an absolutely massive amount of data, you know, uh, potentially is using a, uh, a neural network or deep learning uh, as part of the way that it's making sense of that. And finally, um, I want to end on a um, uh, just a comment on automation. Um, it's important to note that uh, though artificial intelligence can enable automation of certain tasks, and typically at a scale that's otherwise impossible, automation and artificial intelligence are uh, distinct from one another. And it's possible to automate tasks without using artificial intelligence. Um, and there are many forms of automation which do not leverage AI, which tend to be more process-focused activities, things like interview scheduling or moving data from one system uh, to another. And so there's, there's a lot of overlap in AI and automation, and a lot of organizations are looking to use AI to drive automation, but they're two distinct topics and so uh, shouldn't be confused with one another. So I'll wrap up here with kind of our, you know, um, big picture overview of AI, how they work, how they're deployed, um, and uh, with, with this slide here, which is kind of the three, you know, the, the ways to understand how AI is deployed. Today, almost every AI application in whatever industry or, you know, uh, area that it's in, um, it's, is some kind of what's called narrow AI, which means that it's a bespoke model um, and data set to solve one specific problem, which might be having a conversation with a candidate in a pre-screening uh, type of context, um, or it might be parsing information from a resume, but it's one data set applied to kind of one problem, and it can adapt and learn based on new data to get better at solving that specific problem, but it's not gonna be kind of broadly used across multiple uh, domains or problems. Um, and then typically the platform or the programmer can kind of adjust the algorithm um, to align it better to desired outcomes. Now, uh, where things may perhaps be headed um, is uh, this concept of general AI. Um, and this is kind of a, you know, quote unquote sentient system or an AI application that could um, have one, one overarching data model, but be applied to multiple domains, much the same way that, that humans do. Um, we can be put into a new context. We can learn very quickly about that new context and react and adapt to it. Um, this is mostly still theoretical at this point. There are no commercial applications of general AI. It's kind of a very difficult and broad um, uh, problem to solve. Uh, what we'll say is that there's some actually amazing work happening uh, around this. And you know we're probably about five or 10 years from some of the first commercial applications of a general um, AI system uh, in the market. And you know we think that's gonna be a pretty profound impact um, when, when those systems come. That said, um, the kind of hybrid, or the, the intermediate term, what, what we're starting to see is kind of a, a hybrid between you know, these narrowly defined solutions and this kind of general approach which can you know, solve anything, which is what we're, we're tentatively calling the AI platform. Um, and essentially what this describes is a system architecture that can support multiple AI applications. And um, what that means is you know, you, you uh, leverage multiple domains of AI and you kind of aggregate those together into a single system which can kind of use the specific AI model it needs for the specific problem um, that it's trying to solve. Um, and we've seen this kind of AI first approach to systems implementation um, and it, it, as mentioned, incorporates multiple models domains such as you know, uh, near, uh, NLP, predictive analytics, um, deep learning or perhaps unstructured learning. Um, and, and kind of brings those methodologies together under a single umbrella. So we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get into specific HR use cases, uh, which is a nice segue into our next section. So now that we know what artificial intelligence is, how it's deployed in commercial applications, we can now shift gears, we can put our HR and talent acquisition hats on, and we can start looking at its application in HR and talent acquisition technology. I'm going to start um, with, with this illustration here, uh, which I think is a good framing um, for the rest of the conversation about um, specific applications um, in HR and TA. The way that we look at the space is um, as a series of stages in an employee's uh, life cycle, uh, which starts as a candidate, and it starts with sourcing and engaging the activities, and eventually moves on to, to hiring, um, and then the ongoing evaluation and development activities after a hiring is made. 
inside each of those stages are various solution categories. We call them sub-verticals, but really they're a collection of companies that solve a certain problem related to that particular stage a certain way. And so a couple examples might be social networks or job boards inside of the, uh, the, source, um, the source stage. Now, we've thrown on here kind of representative examples of solution categories related to these different stages um, that make very heavy use of artificial intelligence. And what we're trying to illustrate here is if you're trying to answer the question, you know, what areas of the HR function or the talent acquisition function or our talent function, um, you know, could be impacted by AI, uh, um, artificial intelligence, the answer is literally almost anything. And so, um, in the next couple of slides, we're going to go through some kind of specific use cases um, of, you know, what the application of AI actually looks like broadly across um, the uh, employee life cycle. And so um, we'll start with recruiting and then we'll look at uh, some HR um, use cases. Things like job description optimization, uh, which is using systems that understand language to help um, organizations write better job descriptions, primarily with the goal of driving more diverse applicants and making sure that you're not um, leaving applicants out of the system uh, or out of the application process because you wrote them poorly. Um, things like job spend and media management, deciding kind of on what particular uh, platforms or job sites should you spend money to get the most bang and ROI for your buck. AI-based job matching, um, which is really around understanding deeply, you know, what skills does a particular candidate have? Uh, what skills are they likely to have that they may not have even told you? How good of a fit are they going to be against not just a role that they might have applied for, but other roles that might be open inside of the organization. How can we personalize our career site so that the experience is more like, you know, visiting Netflix and getting a, you know, recommendation that actually is relevant for, you know, say a candidate or internal employee who's visiting it uh, versus, um, you know, kind of a static list of, of, of jobs. Um, gamification and other kind of AI-based psychometric assessments, which are kind of a new take on decades-old assessment methodologies. Um, sentiment and textual analysis to understand how you know applicants or employees feel um, at various uh, stages of the journey, um, and then things like automated video transcription um, and analysis uh, use AI to power um, those tools as well. So this, I think this is not you know every single solution that um, uh, that is possible, but it's a pretty good sampling um, of the kinds of things that AI is applied to you in a, in a recruiting context um, today. If we move forward and we look at examples of artificial intelligence in talent management, um, again, quite a, quite a mix here. You have things like pay equity analysis, which is understanding whether or not we're paying um, you know, different demographics as they should, um, and also can predict whether or not you know, a, pay comp a compensation structure that you're setting up uh, is potentially biased uh, based on what you're paying other 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 employees, um, quite a lot of work right now going into understanding internal skills taxonomies and learning and career pathing and using artificial intelligence to understand what it takes to help an employee get from you know possibly where they are today to where they aspire to and which specific courses are going to help them to get there and have they attained mastery over those particular skills um, and and how are those skills developing. Um, things like being able to predict flight risk and employee sentiment have become uh, kind of uh, more prominent recently uh, in light of the great resignation, conversational AI HR assistance, and doing things like being able to correlate activity and um, individual performance to understand and team performance to understand what actually drives productivity inside of an organization. So these are some of the areas that we're seeing AI applied to you inside of um, the kind of post-hire um, technology and HR environment. And I'll end here with, with this thought. We're going to shift gears here in just a moment and talk about kind of some best practices for going in and, and leveraging these tools. But um, I want to call out that typically, as we discussed earlier, you know, most applications of AI are narrowly defined. And, um, but it, we're seeing the rise of multi-purpose platforms. And the idea is that you can house multiple solutions inside um, multiple kind of bespoke solutions inside one umbrella um, platform. And I'll, I'll note that we haven't seen a company that like does everything. So we've, we've got this circle around all these solutions as a, you know, a company that does that. Not necessarily the case today, 
Um, although we do typically see in more kind of platform focused companies, a combination of these um, uh, capabilities under the same umbrella, which is one of the things that you want to consider um, as you're assessing your kind of own internal uh, AI capabilities and going to market perhaps uh, to look to look for additional help. All right, so now we're going to move on to assessing AI capabilities. And the goal here is to help give you some, uh, some ammunition as you're looking internally at what you have in place today, um, and also as you're going to market and talking to uh, solution providers. We're going to start with this idea of kind of an AI of first approach to recruiting and talent management. And um, uh, essentially what you're trying to test out, almost the, the kind of base case today is almost all vendors claim to use artificial intelligence uh, in their solutions. And so given that, like how can you understand the difference between, you know, um, you know, vendor A or vendor B outside of, you know, the specific area that they might address in their solution? Um, so we're going to give you some, some kind of guiding principles here. Um, um, one is thinking about companies in terms of, you know, being uh, an AI company that's solving recruiting versus a recruiting company that's adding, um, you know, artificial intelligence, perhaps so they have the, the buzzword as part of their pitch deck. And a couple of ways you can test this out um, is the number of data scientists that they have on their team as a proportion kind of their workforce, their product roadmap, and their solution approach to new problems. So, you know, um, is the, the kind of solution approach typically an AI first problem? Is that their kind of underlying foundation of the solution? Or is it more something that's been, been bolted on? And then also the number of domains that are addressed uh, by a particular solution. We want to talk a little bit about the pros and cons of an AI-based uh, approach. And uh, the idea here is basically what's the business case for even doing this um, in the first place. And it turns out that the business case for an artificial uh, intelligence-based solution or an AI-based solution is essentially the same as one that's not. It's to, to improve baseline metrics across your organization. Things like time to hire, time to interview, cost per hire, drop-off rates, candidate quality, retention, uh, improve internal promotion, uh, proportions, etc. And what we have found is that generally speaking, um, not true in 100% of cases, but generally speaking, companies that are using AI-based systems as opposed to kind of their um, uh, non-AI-based counterparts um, are performing um, at elevated rates um, uh, compared, compared to um, uh, companies that are not. Some of the things that you have to at least take into consideration um, when using these tools, however, is that um, tools can reinforce uh, or AI-based tools can reinforce existing biases um, if this issue kind of isn't specifically addressed. Um, and we'll talk about some ways you might do that in just a minute here. Another is that bad data can lead to bad outcomes. And so just because a tool has the name, you know, AI as part of its moniker, um, doesn't necessarily make it better. You need a certain kind of depth of data for um, uh, these tools to work properly. That data needs to be trained properly. Um, and it and it it's, it's, uh, takes some nuance to get it right. And so um, we've seen cases where companies have gone in with high expectations, um, but really uh, not the right data set and um, haven't had the greatest of outcomes. And kind of related to that, these tools require some setup and work to get right. And so um, depending on um, you know, the context or the specific problem area being solved, it might require some integrations, it might require some data normalization that needs to happen in order to allow the tool to ingest your existing data. Um, and it might require some fine tuning on the actual algorithmic end to make sure that you know, the results that you're getting back are in line with the goals of the organization and the thing that you're actually trying to accomplish in the first place. So here are some questions that you want to consider. Um, and uh, specifically, if you get to a point where you're going to start building a business case um, and you're going to bring this to your broader stakeholder group, you want to make sure that you can answer these questions um, uh, art and articulate the answer uh, to these questions to a broader group. So first of all, do you know what tools you already um, own that leverage AI? And do you know where that AI is leveraged? Um, it'd be good to know if your organization has an AI policy and if it has an AI policy for um, HR specifically. Uh, since the needs of HR are, you know, a little bit different than, you know, possibly just um, a, another functional area. What business problem is the solution actually addressing? Why are you considering the use of this tool? You should let the business need kind of drive the conversation um, and not just be in the market for, for AI. 
what data is used to train the model? Is the sample size large enough? Is it across clients, across regions? Um, or is it just your own company's data? Um, what is the status of your own data and will the tool be able to ingest it? You know, what existing systems or infrastructure is the tool going to need to integrate with? And is that feasible and who's going to be responsible for that? Are the inputs and outputs of the tool clear, identifiable, and explainable? And do the inputs make sense? Um, and is the solution making decisions or is it providing uh, support? And when we get to kind of risks, uh, this becomes really important to make sure that this is, you know, that you at least understand this. Um, in, in some AI systems, the biggest risk is kind of these black box algorithms where the data is ingested and the output uh, is, is some decision, but the sausage factory or what happens in between there can't be explained by the programmer, by the company, um, the vendor, or the client. And so that's the situation you want to avoid. And you want to make sure that you know what your inputs are. You obviously know what the outputs are, and you know how those two are related and what happened in the middle to arrive from the set of inputs that you gave the specific tool uh, to the, the output that you got at the end. And then can the algorithm itself be fine-tuned, weighted, or adjusted? Um, and if so, how? And how do you measure effectiveness and ROI? And what's your process going to be for, for ongoing review? We think that you know asking these questions in conversations is going to give you significantly good insight into um, how robust uh, a particular vendor's AI capabilities are. If they struggle with answering some of these questions, um, uh, or they can't give you kind of straightforward answers to these, um, it's indicative that you know um, uh, the solution might not be as robust as it's made out to be um, on paper. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about places where an AI initiative can uh, get derailed. Um, one's around uh, leadership and kind of stakeholder buy-in. And so you want to make sure that you're building a strong business case and you've kind of clearly articulated your goals and what you're expecting to get out of a tool. Legal and HR IT review is another area that can be challenging. And so you want to understand and be able to articulate the answers to the questions that we had on the previous page. Um, another one's around data normalization and systems integration. And so you want to check and make sure that your infrastructure is actually ready for an AI solution um, in the area that you're considering. Once you've actually selected a tool, you've gone through all the work of, you know, kind of getting it rolled out, you've also got to get users to start using it. And so, um, you know, some organization has struggled because they haven't had a plan for actually driving tool adoption uh, post-implementation um, and for collecting user and stakeholder feedback. And so you want to make sure that those are set up in advance and also just kind of around broad expectation misalignment. Um, in sales conversation, vendors have the tendency to sell the dream. Um, and then when reality kind of kind of hits and the rubber hits the road and the tool is actually getting implemented, um, you know, results might might um, not live up to expectations that were set. And so we, we think the best practice is to make sure that you and the vendor are aligned on goals, milestones, and expected results. And you want to doc document in writing both parties' responsibilities to have as a fallback in case something goes awry. Um, down the road. And finally, I want to wrap up with AI ethics and, and risks. Um, and we think that uh, these are important topics uh, to consider and um, should be kind of approached thoughtfully uh, from an organizational perspective. So when it comes to AI ethics, really what we're talking about is, you know, what outputs should an algorithm be designed to optimize? And what means or inputs are we willing to accept to achieve those outcomes? Um, and really, we think there's a, you know, um, kind of a conversation just to be had internally. You know, what do we want to use AI for? Um, uh, and, you know, what data sources are we willing to accept? Um, you know, as an example, you know, some um, uh, organizations will kind of proactively reach out to try to boost um, using AI uh, job advertisements that go to diverse candidates. Um, but are you excluding, you know, uh, other other individuals by, by doing that. And there isn't really necessarily a right answer here. And so it's just a conversation to have internally um, around uh, how you want to use AI, what data and inputs that you want to use, and, and, and what, um, what are we willing to accept to achieve those outcomes. Some general best practices we'll give is that, you know, any algorithm you're using should be transparent and there, again, should be justification um, in between the inputs and the outputs. Um, you want to make sure that the uh, data is auditable and, you know, we call this equal kind of opportunity algorithms. You essentially, you want to make sure that you're not inadvertently um, having a disparate impact on any particular population as a result of um, uh, AI that you're using. Um, we've seen some organizations leverage diversity dashboards and, and capability matrices 
um, to kind of keep an eye on these things and use AI proactively um, uh, to uh, kind of understand the composition of their workforce. Um, so we think this is kind of a, a, a great, probably, um, example of how to do this um, well. Then I want to talk a little bit about kind of risk in HR and AI use cases. And really, we think about risk in a couple of different ways. One is um, uh, how is the tool leveraged? And if it's leveraged to automate a process, we think that's relatively low risk. Is the tool being used to in, uh, inform an employment decision? Probably medium risk. Uh, it's actually, that's a, a great use case uh, for it, as long as you know, it's not the one actually making the decision. Um, but in cases where the tool is being used to make an employment decision, it's high risk. And we go on the record and say that you probably shouldn't use any tool uh, to make um, a, an actual hiring decision. You should have some kind of human review um, or augmentation to any AI-based system that's involved in decisioning. Um, some other kind of systemic risk here is uh, one systemic bias that could be potentially perpetuated by historic training data. Um, uh, as we've discussed earlier, the propensity for bad data to lead to bad outcomes and um, uh, kind of a tangential risk is just around kind of the whole uh, experience and human perception of, of either using a, an AI-based system or interacting with one um, um, in, a, in a hiring context. And we've got some kind of examples here um, with specific vendors. I just want to call out that um, these are examples. It's not a representative list. And the, the idea here is for education um, and, and, and not anything else. So as an example, you know, these are kind of low risk examples, um, you know, career site personalization, I'll call out here. You know, if you're if you're using, say, AI um, to provide kind of a more, um, you know, delightful experience for somebody who's visiting a website, um, you know, whether or not they're served the exact right um, uh, job. Uh, isn't going to impact their eventual em employment with the company. It's not making a decision. And so, you know, this can be a, a, a delightful experience and, you know, low risk from an organizational perspective. Um, and kind of the medium risk area, again, if you're looking at, say, matching, um, you know, this is an area where, uh, you know, uh, a tool is possibly analyzing millions of resumes, job posts, and profiles, and using the learnings to help match, you know, a candidate to a role. Um, along with a match score. And really the risk is just involved in how you actually use that data. Um, you know, if it's used for augmentation, totally fine. It's perfect and it's helpful. If it's used as kind of a decisioning point or a pass fail, um, then you might be um, uh, in a little bit stickier situation. And really the goal should be understanding, um, you know, what goes into that score and kind of quality pipeline, pipelines in a, in a consistent and ongoing way. Um, and then some, some higher maybe risk use cases. Uh, for example, um, uh, one might be um, using, say, voice analysis um, that detects emotions, you know, and, and potentially is correlated with success in a role, uh, uh, but uses that to build kind of a psychological profile and, uh, you know, uses the pass fail for job fit. Um, there's a number of issues that, that, you know, might be problematic here. You know, for example, or... Um, you know, is voice inflection really the best, um, you know, the best measure to, 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 to predict whether somebody's going to be successful in a role? Is there room for error? Is there maybe some, you know, disability considerations that you might need to take into account or, you know, maybe English is a second language? Um, so in any case, you know, that type of a system might have a little bit higher risk. At the end of the day, we think the, you know, the, the best thing to do here is um, uh, use AI to augment decision making and not replace human decision making and if you if you if you do that you're gonna you're gonna stay um abreast of uh, or ahead of missteps finally just want to talk about kind of the regulatory uh, environment that's coming up um we think that uh more ai regulation is likely but we think there's some best practices you can implement today to keep your organization um aligned sailing in the right direction and and ahead of all this um, I'll just call out by noting that there's a number of states that have already proposed or implemented uh, AI regulation related to hiring, uh, which is illustrated in the maps here. And some recent examples is New York City kind of targeting um, uh, AI bias in hiring under a new law that is proposing. And what it requires is an annual audit for, for disparate impact and immediate rectification of any gaps. Um, it requires the disclosure of AI and um, you know, how that data is being used to a candidate or an employee. And then it's got some fees for non-compliance, which start at $500 per day. 
Um, what I would say, and um, our view on this, is actually this is what companies should be doing anyways. Um, you shouldn't be using AI and not informing uh, your candidates and your employees that you're doing it. Uh, you should know where AI is used in the in the um, in the process, and you should know what it's being used for. Um, and so, you know, we think this is not necessarily something to be scared of, um, but rather just something you should embrace and prepare for proactively. And so, you know, we think individuals should self-regulate. Um, any vendor that you're talking to should be capable of doing a um, disparate impact audit or bias audit, and show you again the kind of relation between their inputs and outputs. And then you want to internally document where and how AI is used throughout the hiring and employment lifecycle. In particular, note where it's used for process automation, say, versus where it could potentially impact a hiring decision. Um, and then you want to make sure that in any candidate or employee-facing technology, you're disclosing proactively um, how AI is being leveraged um, in some kind of a disclosure, even if not legally required. And so we'll, we'll wrap this all up with just kind of a synopsis. We've gone through quite a bit. We've talked about what AI is. Um, we've talked about uh, how it's used inside of HR applications. Um, we've talked about some of the considerations and way that you can assess vendor capabilities. We've asked, talked about some of the, the questions that you want to ask um, and about some of the potential risks and ethics concerns that you, that you want to make sure that you address going into these conversations. Um, so to sum it all up, AI describes systems that can make human-like decisions uh, at scale. And almost every vendor that you're going to talk to will likely claim to be using some kind of AI. And so it's, the impetus is really on you to understand what that means and to ask the right questions to be able to figure out uh, what business problem is this particular solution solving and how is AI used in the context of that, of that business problem. Um, AI-driven systems can drive massive improvements over existing process, and, but they require some additional work and uh, ongoing monitoring to maximize their effectiveness. We think the best way to think about these tools is to lead with your business challenge, uh, and your business problem, what you're actually trying to solve for, and let that drive the conversation as opposed to the other way around. And um, you're going to want to understand what parts of the hiring process that AI impacts your organization today and in the future to make sure that you're set up for any kind of regulatory changes that are coming around the corner. And so with that, and that wraps up our conversation. I want to say thank you to everybody. I hope you found this valuable. Um, again, my name is David Francis. Um, if you have any questions or you, you want to swap notes, feel free to reach out and uh, wish you success uh, as you use, search for, and leverage uh, AI in your HR function.